Welcome to Short Course, episode 103, for May 26th, 2023. I'm your host, Ben Barry. This past Monday was the monthly indoor match that I help run at a, a local indoor range near here, and I realized time has really flown. It's almost two years since we started this match, so this would have be our 22nd match, so it'll be two years in July. And the first match that we did was actually a a small scaled down affair just as a test, really, Uh, just trying to run things with a a few of the employees and a few invited guests at the the range. But yeah, since then, this was our basically our 21st full match with 30 people running four stages on on two bays. And this is something that I I was not doing when I started short course in 2018. Uh, but obviously started in 2021, just as we were starting to come out of the pandemic. And I just thought it would be, I I hadn't really talked about on the podcast, and it'd be interesting to just go over some of the lessons learned and some of the things that that I think have, some of the things I know now that I didn't know two years ago when when we started the match. So the, the match format itself is actually, it's a continuation of a match that was going on well before I got into the sport. So it, it was going on in 2010 at a different range. Uh, that was actually, is, the range still exists. It's, it's run by uh, the Wake County government. But in 2014, the guys who were running the match kind of were getting tired of it, wanted to hand it off. And a buddy and I ended up taking it over. And it was it was basically a simple split where he you know was the, the employee who had badge access to the building and he ran the practice score sign up. And I did the rules and the stage design and basically made sure every made sure the actual shooting was all hunky dory and that worked well for a couple of years and then he decided he wanted to go it alone without my help and that lasted a little while and then someone else ended up taking over that match and then eventually of all things in in 2018 a new county sheriff uh was elected and basically kicked the the matches out of the range and so that was that was the end of that i you know at this time i i was um I was shooting USPSA quite a bit, but it was still nice to to get to go shoot. It was a it was a four stage match. I mean this this range it's four bays that are all ten lanes wide. It's an indoor cinder block building, so it's a common firing line. So when it's open to the public, it's not really the best situation to to go shoot because the whole line has to go cold. But for running matches, it was great because we could set up four separate stages on four separate bays, and we would run four squads of 15 to 17 shooters. I mean, we'd sign up 17 and sometimes all of them would show up. Typically we'd have a few no-shows. So typically it was, it was 60 shooters, four squads of 15 or so. And we'd get through there in about three hours, which, which was awesome. It was a really cool facility. I, I haven't talked to anybody involved with that range. I don't know if it'll, if it'll ever come back, but I sort of was known as having been involved with that match. And so two years ago, a little more than two years ago now, someone who worked at, who was a USPSA shooter who worked at a, a local indoor range that actually happens to only be five minutes from my house. So it really is ideal. Uh, he, he approached me and said, you know, I know you used to run this match. Would you be interested in running a, a similar match at our range? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And so we, we started sitting down and talking things through and the format that we ended up coming up with is, is what we still have today, where, they have they have three bays, but we figured let's just do four stages, two stages per bay on two bays, run two squads of fifteen, and and call that good. And that formula, like I said, has has been successful so far. As far as the the format for the rules, I I explicitly wanted this to inherit sort of the tradition of of that previous match, which I found was a, a really interesting mix of shooters because it was not a USPSA match, it was not an IDPA match, but it was this very sort of pure run what you brung outlaw sort of sort of flavor. So I, I don't claim to have invented any of this, but I saw that it worked really well and, and I wanted to continue it. And so the, the, the match format is, is really very simple. It's a simple time plus scoring. Now, the old match when it was run at the, the Wake County range, they used a second per point down. And ironically, that was before IDPA went to a second per point down, which I, I think from my limited experience shooting it in IDPA and shooting it at the old match, I think a second is is too punishing. I think uh, what we do at, at this match, which is 
the one major change that I made when, when we were setting up this match is I changed it to a half second per point down, which is what IDPA was when I got into it. And I think that is... That is a good balance. I think it is enough that if you can immediately make up a, a down one, if you can immediately call a Charlie and shoot a makeup in 25 hundredths or 30 hundredths, then you come out a little bit ahead. But if you've already transitioned off the target, you just have to eat that, eat that Charlie. It's not worth making up every single point, trying to shoot every stage down zero, which with a second per point down, I, I feel like IDPA pretty much does currently. Not that I've shot it a ton since that change, but the few times that I have shot it, I've, I've found it that basically if you're not shooting every stage clean, you're you're really hurting yourself. There's basically no shot that you're going to see at an IDPA match where taking a down one is worth the, the second penalty. So to me, the, the the time plus scoring, it's very beginner friendly. It's, it's very simple. It's just your time. And then we go through and we add half seconds per, for every point down. And so uh, a down one is a half second, down three we use IDPA targets. Uh, down three is, you know, three half seconds, so a second and a half. And then a miss is five half seconds or two and a half seconds. We do have a, a pretty stiff penalty for no shoots, which is five whole seconds. Um, again, that's the way that the match, when I shot it at, at the Wake County range, ran. It's also the the penalty in IDPA. And I think it's pretty pretty stiff enough to keep you off the no shoots. So, I you know, it definitely can can punish folks sometimes. Now, we do also use the, the IDPA system where shoot-throughs count. So if your shot is an inch inside the perf in the no-shoot, we still give you the the down one or the down zero, whatever the shoot-through was, just because it's it it felt to me when you know we were writing the rules that having the the penalty for a no-shoot also be a miss was was rather stiff. I don't actually know how much of a, of a difference that makes, you know, the difference between five seconds and seven and a half seconds to your score. <laughs> you know, if you, if you hit the no shoot, things are already pretty bad. We don't set up targets where shoot throughs happen a lot. So it hasn't really been an issue in terms of actually, you know, one, one target shooting through into another target. So that's something that we just kind of haven't touched since, since we set the rules up, but it's been working fine. But that's definitely a difference from from USPSA rules, but not one that I'm strongly attached to. But yeah, so you know, as a as a new shooter, you just your time is from the beep to your last shot, and then you just have penalties added for for inaccuracy, and we just have a generic three second procedural penalty. So you know, shooting outside the fault lines, not doing a reload when specified, not shooting one handed when specified, basically any not following the procedure for any reason, and we have a a general policy that it's just one procedural per incident unless it's some kind of egregious advantage in which case we'll do one per shot fired but i'm trying to remember a scenario where we've actually assessed one per shot fired and i I can't one does not come to mind as far as gear rules we just have one division everybody shoots heads up against everybody else this range does not allow people to draw from inside the waistband holsters which i think is kind of cheesy one of the things that i liked about the old wake range was that was back in the days before IDPA allowed appendix carry. And so that was the one match where I could actually shoot my gun from appendix. Now that said, these days, I don't really, that really doesn't matter to me, to me, this stuff, I, it's the shooting of my carry gun in a match. That's interesting. If I have to draw it from an outside the waistband holster, that's not how I really carry it. Well, I can practice draws at home. What I can't practice at home is the actual moving and shooting and engaging unfamiliar targets and that sort of thing. So to me, being able to shoot the gun in competition is more important than being able to draw it from exactly the way I carry it. Because again, I can practice draws at home. I can't necessarily practice live fire in, in matches at home. Right. So yeah, center fire guns, nine millimeter or larger. I don't know that we've had anybody come through wanting to shoot a 380. We'd probably be fine with that. We draw the line, no 22s. Although if, again, if we had like a 10 year old want to shoot it with a 22, we'd probably make an exception for that. But, but you know, that's the nice thing about running an outlaw match is you can kind of make case by case exceptions like that. And then the the general format of the stages is that generally on one of the bays, we'll have more props set up and there'll be more of a prop heavy kind of field course stage set up. And that stage typically will be a, you know, start toes on sticks or touching some, you know, a USPSA style field course where you're just you have a given start position and then it's engage the targets from within the shooting area do a reload somewhere between your first and last shot, which when you think about it is effectively the way most USPSA stages operate 
if they have a round count greater than the magazine capacity of your carry optics or limited gun. So if it's a, if it's a 26 round stage, basically you just have to do a reload somewhere in the middle of the stage. And then typically on that bay, we'll set aside, we'll, we'll either, you know, have a shooting box off to the side or something like that. And we'll use a few of those targets as a subset and do some kind of skill drill classifier ish kind of thing where maybe it's draw, shoot two on each mandatory reload, step into another box to each that kind of thing. Sometimes we'll mix in picking the gun up off a barrel, reloading off a barrel, something, you know, some kind of weapon manipulation, just something like that to add a little variety to to that stage, which otherwise is sort of a basic, fairly vanilla six reload six type stage. But that that balances out because the, the field course stage tends to be a little slower to reset just because it tends to be typically it'll be 16 to 18 to 20 rounds, somewhere in that range. So basically eight to eight to 10 targets. And, the, you know, even with a 15-man squad, that just will take a little bit longer to, to walk around and, and score and paste and everything. So typically we'll have those two stages paired on one bay, and then on the other bay we'll have more of an, uh, an even split. We'll have two sort of short course type stages where one might have a, a little bit of a shooting area where you, you move a little bit, and then we'll also have some stages that have more of a kind of gamey puzzle element like... There are three barrels on each barrel. There's a card. You move to the barrel, you flip over the card, and the card tells you something about which target to shoot or how many shots to shoot or you know something like that. And we've done a, a number of different variations on those kinds of stages over over the years. But that's a that's a nice way to add a little bit of variety without a lot of props. You don't need a lot of walls or or anything like that. But it 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 challenges shooters to react to some kind of stimulus during the stage, not just pre visualize. Go here, shoot this. Go there, shoot that. And so, you know, the, the goal of all this is to make each individual set of four stages a relatively well-rounded test. So I like to have at least one of the stages will have some kind of strong hand shooting somewhere in it. I like to have, you know, some kind of shooting on the move, but also a static draw and, and flat-footed reload just to test doing those things quickly. You want open targets, you want partials, you want far targets, you want near targets. And so I just, in every in every batch of four stages that I design... Not only do they have to use our, our limited props budget, not only do they have to fit on these two bays in a way that they don't over they don't conflict with each other, but I, I do also try and make each set of four stages a sort of well-rounded, well-balanced, generalized shooting test to try and test each individual skill. And I mean, I will say it definitely takes, you know, takes a little bit of time to design the stages and not just have them all be very samey and, and try and work all these things in in different formats and you know, I'll one ma- one month I'll do a match with, you know, one of these turn over the card, shoot what it says type stages. Or, you know, one time we had one where you turned over a card and that told you which barrel you had to move to next, which was fun, but complicated. So I'll do one of those every other month or every three months, something like that. So it's not it's not a constant thing, but, you know, just cycling through those kinds of different challenges, but but always keeping it using similar patterns, but but keeping it fresh, never trying to repeat just the same stages over and over again. So when I sat down to try and come up with a list of sort of all the lessons learned over the last two years, the the first one is I I will say the the idea of not having gear divisions has had something of a mixed result, which is that what we see is a lot of full size race guns with dots and people shooting 140 40 millimeter mags. Now a lot of this is there you know we get some carryover from either the tactical guys where those kinds of extended mags and dots are, are all the rage, but you know, it's also standard in carry optics. People have been shooting guns that were, that are now USPSA legal in, in limited optics. So, you know, I've seen a few slide ride 2011s because that's, you know, what people want to shoot, which is fine. And so there, the, even though the, the gear rules were sort of specifically left wide open to not try and recognize one type of gear over another. What that has definitely ended up creating is a tendency for people to use race gear when there's kind of no other recognition. And I mean, I will say my stage design probably does not help with this. I definitely tend to try and put out shots that are somewhat challenging. I mean, every match will have at least one shot that's going to be on, you know, beyond 10 yards on an open target. And I can definitely see that being intimidating to someone shooting a SIG P365, which, you know, there was a, we've had people show up and shoot those for a few matches. We've seen some, some actual genuine carry guns, but 
to be totally honest, not as many as I would like. And, I, you know, I don't know exactly how to change that. I, I would like to have a way to recognize people shooting non full size, you know, race guns, basically. I mean, they don't have comps and they're not shooting nine millimeter major, but, but these are, these are race guns. These are dotted 2011s. These are CZ shadow twos. I mean, these are, these are not guns that you would use anywhere outside of a, a competition scenario, which is fine. If that's what people want to shoot, I, I I'm not trying to downplay that, but it, it, I do wonder what could we do to recognize people shooting guns other than than that if that's the default the the idea that i keep playing around with is it would be nice to have some kind of instead of having divisions where you have to meet all the criteria of a division if you could have sort of division categories so for example when you're signing up you can check a box that says i'm shooting 10 rounds or less and that could be you're just going to load your mags to 10 or less because you like shooting production or like shooting idpa style or you have a gun that only holds 10 rounds or less whether that's a revolver or maybe you have a, a carry gun that holds 12, but you're going to load it to 10 so you can meet this equipment category, so to speak. You can then also check irons, or you could also check Glock 19 or smaller. You could also check concealment. And so potentially you could check you know, all four of these boxes if you were shooting an iron-sighted Glock 19 and you only loaded the mags to 10. Or if you, and you were shooting from concealment. Or if you wanted to shoot concealed with your Glock 19, but load the mags up to 15, you know, you only check a few of the boxes. The main reason I haven't done this is I don't actually know how it would show up in the results. But to me, I I think that's kind of where my mind goes is instead of having, if I were writing divisions, instead of having divisions like USPSA, where you're either in this one, or you're in that one, it would be sort of, you could just mark on your registration, hey, here are all the basically all the handicaps that I'm putting on myself. Would that be interesting? I have no idea, but but that's something that I've been thinking about, and, and maybe one day I'll, I'll end up doing that, but that that's really the only thing that I can see because there are a number of different ways. So, for example, this this past match on Monday, just for fun, I brought out my iron-sighted Glock 17, but I was shooting with 10-round mags just because I've kind of been in this production mode, and so I wanted to force myself to do the extra reloads, but also not necessarily shoot a heavy cheater gun like a, like a stock two. And so in that case, I would have checked the 10 rounds or less and the irons box, but not the small gun or the concealment box. So just an example, maybe again, something I'll, I'll play with at some point. But in terms of just having the, the match be an open playing field, people can run whatever, whatever you know, gun they want. Everything is allowed. There's no special recognition for certain things. I think in terms of being beginner friendly, there, there definitely is that. Now it definitely steers beginners towards wanting fancier gear, which I mean, Whatever. They, they, to some degree, that's always going to happen. But I think there is something to be said for having a carve out and, and recognizing people who compete well with either a gun they actually carry or something that is in, in some way a handicap and not just a $3,000 gun with a dot on it and 140 millimeter mags and, you know, weighs 50 ounces and, and all of this. And in terms of, of gun capacity, that that's the other thing is, yeah, OK, you might have 140 millimeter mags, but like I said, our longest stages typically are 18 or 20 rounds. Most stages are going to be 12 to 14. And so the extra capacity really doesn't necessarily buy you that much. In an average match across the four stages, you're probably going to be doing three reloads typically. They'll, they'll generally be one stage where, for whatever reason, there, there's a, the reload isn't required. But sometimes it'll be all four that, that will require a reload. Again, either in that format of reload somewhere between the first and last shot, or sometimes on some of these more prescriptive stages it'll be a reload that's that's required at a certain point during the stage. So to take the the match from this past Monday, for example, we had we had one stage where there were there were four paper targets and you started in the middle of the shooting area. And and this was this was the shooting area used as a bigger part of the stage, but you just started at the front and, and we only used four of the the eight paper targets that were set up on the bay for this one stage. And you just had to move, put two on each paper target which meant basically moving to two different positions because you could see two from from each of the two positions, do a mandatory reload, and then re-engage each target with one shot, strong hand only. So it was a 12-round stage, had a mandatory reload, had four of the 12 shots, strong hand only, but it was freestyle in the sense that you could make makeup shots at any time. You just had to fire at least one shot at each target from each, from you know, at the at after the the, the specified reload. And so 
I really like stages like that because they have this sort of freestyle aspect. You, you really, it's you're not going to rack up a, a procedural penalty as long as you at least follow the stage procedure. But at the same time, it does reward getting things right and and not having a ton of makeup shots. So obviously, the fastest way, you know, in theory, could you could you shoot three on each, do the reload, and then and then blast one strong hand, not really aiming, and end up you know with with the strong hand shots being a little bit wild. Theoretically, you could. I would be curious to actually run that and see if that was if that was actually would get you a better score. But typically, people don't do that. I don't know if that's because it's an outlaw match and people sort of have a little bit of respect for the 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 I don't know the spirit of the stage to to use a sort of cheesy term. But those kinds of stages, they're very simple. But like I said, they they test the reload, they test the draw, they test a little bit of one handed shooting without relying entirely on it and it it has that that movement element whereas you know one of the other stages the on the other bay this was this was sort of the more standards type stage is you started in one box that was like 13 yards back and you had one target that was at like eight yards and then two targets that were at at 13 yards up against the berm and you drew put two on each body and then moved forward to a box that was five yards ahead, and in between the two boxes there was a barrel with your reload magazine on it. And so you had to move forward to that front box, grab the the reload mag off the barrel on your way to the box, reload with that mag, and then from the front box, the, the two targets that were further away that you could now, were the only targets you could see because you had moved past the, 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 the closer of the three targets that you shot from the first box, you then had to put two headshots on each of those. So again, two body shots on three targets, reload off a barrel while moving forward, and then two headshots on two targets. So it was only a 10-round stage, but there was a lot of sort of technical nuance to, to program in. Is it is that too much? I'm not really sure. I mean, I people seem to handle it on the stage. They they seem to understand it. It doesn't it it so far hasn't been too much of an issue. I think definitely for new shooters, putting them down lower in the order so they can kind of it, even if the brief doesn't necessarily make sense to them, they can follow along. They can watch other shooters. That definitely helps. And so, you know, bumping newer shooters down so they can just kind of monkey see, monkey do, I think definitely is a benefit. There's there's definitely an art to reading a written stage brief, which I write, you know, I write these briefs for every stage, but there's something about seeing someone doing it when you don't have that experience versus trying to read it and imagine it. And so, yeah, I think having having reloads at, specific mandated points in some of these more standards ish classifier ish dictated stages where we're basically using using the stage procedure in place of props to add complexity you know could we if we had infinite walls and barrels and fault lines could we build a stage that that forced this yes but at this range i have six walls two half walls and 12 target stands to work with. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having to always be economizing on these things. And so just being able to write something into the brief is definitely something that is a, a useful stage design tool. And I think we'll come around to this more at the end, but I, I think this is definitely an opportunity that, that USPSA is, is missing out on in terms of allowing some degree of that at local matches where props are, are in short supply, more so than at level two matches and above. And like I've said, I have tried a few different things in terms of ways to require one-handed shooting, because I think, especially for a match like this, shooting strong hand only, I think is very practical. I don't know that I'll ever come around to requiring weekend only shooting. I think that is a neat advanced skill, but I think you get a lot of the benefit of, of testing that, that one-handed shooting just from requiring strong hand and, you know, just having for, for what is supposed to be a relatively beginner friendly match. I, I just shy away from, from the weekend shooting thing. Now, I would be happy to see more of that even at level one USPSA matches with the expectation that a level one USPSA matches is something that you should be prepared to go to. It shouldn't necessarily be your first match that you ever show up to. How we get to that expectation being reality is another question, but I would like to see some some strong hand, especially if we could find ways to work it into stages, which brings me back to what I was saying, which is the the, the three basic patterns are pretty straightforward. So, you know, one is you have to shoot everything stronghand after a mandatory reload. The second is you have to shoot everything stronghand from a given box. So typically there'll be a box further back where you shoot freestyle. And then when you move forward, you can shoot makeups, but everything from that box has to be fired one-handed or something that 
I think I mentioned on the podcast before was a, you know, building a stage where one of the positions had a few targets through a port and all shots through the port had to be fired strong hand only. And that one really, I mean, honestly was my favorite so far because it has this freestyle element. It's kind of like getting down to a low port. You can decide, do you want to end with the one-handed shooting or do you want to go to that port, do the one-handed shooting and then reestablish your grip afterward, which honestly is not a challenge that, that we really see. And so, you know, to me, the question is, as long as you can, you can figure out some way to clearly administer, clearly, very clearly tell, hey, the shooter was in the place where they should be firing one handed only, whether that's, I mean, I could even see having a a special shooting area within the shooting area, maybe with different colored fault lines or something like that, where you can shoot in the whole shooting area, but any shots taken while you're inside the fault lines, the blue fault lines or something like that those those have or downrange of a given wall or you know some some way of clearly demarcating that hey if the shooter is in this position or firing through this port then those shots all have to be with one hand i would love to see something like that even even beyond you know what we've talked about in the past with ipsc where you can declare that a, a whole stage has to be shot strong or weekend i actually kind of really like this idea of being able to require a fraction of the stage in a way that is clearly administrable to be shot one handed only and obviously that's an idea that I'm playing with at this outlaw match, which if this were a USPSA match would not be allowed. And so that's one of the ways that I actually find this an interesting test bed to try out these ideas. And, and I look forward to continuing that. You know, I'll talk again a little bit more later about why, about the challenges that affiliating with USPSA would present. But, you know, even even if I'm elected to the board, I don't know that I would that I would want this match to immediately affiliate because there are a lot of pros of being outlaw currently. Now, would I like to see a lot of these things built into the USPSA rule set so that so that matches like this indoor match could run under USPSA and still retain all this stuff? Absolutely. But at least for the time being, the, the way the USPSA rules really are focused on outdoor matches, field courses, nationals, you know, having having these kinds of being able to provide these kinds of restrictions and build the kind of stages that I want isn't an option. And so to me, affiliating doesn't make sense right now. But who knows what the future holds. And that is where we'll wrap for this week. I ended up recording this whole episode uh, in in one take, but it is long enough to be two episodes, so I'm going to break it here and release the second half next week. So we will uh, leave you on that cliffhanger and talk to you next week. That wraps up this episode of Short Course. My email is ben at barryshooting.com. Talk to you next time.